Hi, this is Dennis Spaeth, publisher, Cutting Tool Engineering, here in Troy, Michigan at Seagull Tools North American headquarters. I'm here with Jay Ball, the product manager for Solid Milling, and Jay is talking to us about uh, optimized roughing, and I want to delve into how a shop decides when it's appropriate to use this and when it isn't. Uh, how, are, how are they making up their minds? That's a really good question, and we see that a lot. You know, customers hear about optimized roughing, they read about it, they see the videos online, and what I look for when I walk into a shop is not just the machine and the cam software the customer uses or the holders, but I actually look at the part complexity. The part is the, the number one telltale whether this job can be used with optimized roughing or do you need to use a different type of strategy. So what I look for when I walk into a shop that is looking at getting an optimized roughing, if they have parts that are straight walled, prasmatic 2D parts where you can utilize that full flute length like we talked about in one of the earlier videos, you know, if I buy an end mill that's got one inch of flute, I want to use that whole one inch of flute. So really for those, those pockets, those cavities, those straight walled 2D profiles, that's really where you're going to get the most benefit out of optimized roughing because when you start to reduce your depth of cut, you actually lose productivity, you lose metal removal rates, and the name of the game is metal removal rates. You want to get parts out the door faster. On the contrary, though, if you have really complex 3D mold cavities with a lot of surfaces, a lot of shapes, you've got aerospace components that had a lot of different changes in Z levels, you really want to try to avoid optimized roughing. The approach to those types of applications might be more suited for high feed roughing, where you're taking light depth of cuts at high feed rates that get you closer to near net shape. If you try to optimize rough those parts with a large depth of cut, you get these really big stair steps, which in turn actually increases the amount of semi-finished work you have to do with another tool because you've got those giant stair steps and that have to be removed before the finished process. So that will increase your cycle time, decrease productivity, and affect how many parts you get out the door. So as good as optimized roughing is, it does have its limitations. So as a, as a shop is trying to decide whether to use optimized roughing, how much uh, do material characteristics come into play in making that decision? They play a really big role, actually, because depending on the market segment, whether it be medical, aerospace, power gen, mold and dye, all these materials machine differently. Not all materials are created the same. You know, you've got all these different types of inconels, wasp alloys, hast alloys, different types of titanium. You know, for years it was just, hey, there's, I got a machine in titanium, but now there's 777 titanium, there's H titanium. So when the customer's looking at optimized roughing, you know, they've identified their part configuration looks good, their machine tool looks good, they've got the right cam software. When it comes to materials, any sort of material that wants to push back or that is very susceptible to work hardening, like those super duplex stainlesses, the inconels, those types of materials lend themselves very well to optimized roughing because, like I talked about before, optimized roughing controls the heat. You know, you've got a lighter radial step over, large depth of cut, you don't have all the heat associated with traditional milling strategies. So for me, you, you've got to look at the entire process of the entire part. You know, that's how you're going to be able to best determine if optimized roughing is really good for your type of application. So we've covered a lot of ground in the last three videos mm -hmm. on optimized roughing, and I want to thank you for taking all that time with us. But uh, you know, if someone needs more mm -hmm. information about this, and this is just whetting their appetite, you have a training facility here that you can Correct. provide additional training. You want to give uh, some idea how someone could go about getting that training? Yeah, so one thing that Seco has always been very passionate about and adamant about is training you know, customers, distributors, end users. Um, we have a STEP program, and it's a three-step program that customers can come in and we can talk about you know, just general machining basics to make sure everyone has the common understanding. But then in the step two and step three classes, we get into the more advanced strategies. So customers get exposed to part processing, when to use optimized roughing or when to use high feed strategies, looking at machine characteristics, machine abilities of different materials. So you know, online on the secotools.com uh, website, we've got all the different step classes that are available. So there is a lot of training information out there, but coming in for a day or two, um, you know, to get that one-on-one -on -one hands-on training is really most beneficial for the customers.